and I've yeah, I just realized that my microphone was muted this whole time because I'm so used to doing Zoom meetings and logging in <laughs> with the microphone shut off. Uh, so I'll try that again. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, a live stream for Exorcisms Analytical April. My name's Aaron. I'm a developer based in Boston, and I'm happy to be with you tonight while I work on some exercises in the Julia language. So just some background about myself. Um, I've studied applied math. Uh, I use Julia most every day at my job. I have for years now. It's one of my favorite languages to use, and I'm really pleased to get to show some stuff to you all tonight. So just give me a second to share my screen and all that, and then we'll get started. And of course, get the infinite window going here. So I will get my setup. That's the wrong one. Cool. So I um, will be using the Exorcism CLI tool tonight. Uh, you can do Exorcism exercises. Oops, I'm sharing the wrong window. Sorry about that. Share the whole screen. It's easier. Great. So hopefully. Technical difficulties have gotten out of the way at this point. Of course, now that I said that, I'll probably <laughs> regret it later on. Um, so I will be making use of the Exorcism CLI tool to download the exercises tonight. Um, you can also use uh, the web interface to work on these exercises. I just am a little bit more used to using the CLI tool, so I will be doing that. So the first exercise I'd like to take a look at tonight, let me see if I already have it here, and if so, yeah, no, I don't already have it yet. So the first ex exercise I'd like to take a look at tonight is called Saddle Points. It's just a simple, relatively simple exercise in which we will write some code to take in a matrix and identify any uh, points in that matrix, any positions in that matrix that correspond to saddle points. And we'll explain a little bit about what that means in a second. So this is, and here I'll even make this a little bit bigger yet, because last time I did have a little bit of trouble with the font size being a little tiny, at least uh, looking back on it. So this is how these generally play out. I won't go through how to actually set up the CLI tool because the directions themselves on Exorcism more or less give you all the tools you'll need, including the API key if you're set up uh, with an account. So I'll skip that for now. Uh, but once you've got it set up, all you really need to do is call a command like this specify the exercise and which track you'd like to use. And of course, half the time I don't remember which one is which, so I will go ahead and you know copy and paste this command from the Exorcism website and you know do the rest of my work locally. So of course, we're like I said, we're doing the saddle points exercise. We're looking at the Julia track. Uh, many of these exercises show up in different tracks. Uh, not all of them do, mostly because someone has to <laughs> implement that exercise in that particular language in order for it to be offered. So Julia does have a pretty wide selection of exercises. Uh, taking a look here, um, I want to say there's in the neighborhood of around 55, 60 exercises that can be done. Uh, which is a pretty big number. So this is a great way to learn Julia if it's a language you're interested in learning. Um, that's one of the reasons why I came to Exorcism is because Julia's website actually recommends it as a potential way to get used to, to get started with the language if you really like to get your hands dirty first off. Um, that's kind of how I like to learn is to um, to try and apply things as soon as possible, which isn't necessarily the most efficient way, but it's, it's what I tend to like. So I'll go ahead and download this. Right, and I've got everything here. I've got this uh, saddle points directory that I'll move into. And so, and it might be even easier to look at it like this. Um, this is how these exercises tend to look in Julia, in Exorcism, right? We have a single file that corresponds to the exercise. We have a tests file, which, you know, um, I'll take a look at in a second. And then we have a readme, which describes the exercise and a help, which usually is the same from exercise to exercise within a track. This will more basically just tell you about stuff about, you know, how to set up the exercise, how to submit it, and that kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and open this. So first off, right, I will go ahead and delete uh, my previous work here. I did work on this exercise about a year ago, or I guess maybe not quite that long ago, maybe a month or two ago. Um, but I'm going to start from scratch here. I haven't really looked at it in the last, like I said, month or two, so we'll be doing it more or less live. 
but in full disclosure, I have worked this exercise at some point in the past. So the first thing I usually like to do is just start with a blank file like this and take a look at the tests. So I'll take a look at this run tests file. And Julia has a package called tests or a, a, a package called tests that is built into the language. You know, we do have to do this using tests in order to get it active. But it gives us all this nice stuff like these macros for putting together test sets, for actually testing expressions, and that kind of thing. Right. So what I'll do is I'll disable all but this first test for now. This is usually a good way to do this. So exorcism pr promotes uh, test-driven development pretty strongly, and that uh, one great way, and even I think the best way to work through these exercises is to focus on getting the test to pass one at a time. Right? First test, second test, third test, fourth test. Um, that's a good habit to get into. Of course, development doesn't always look like that, nor really should it, I think. I think there are some cases where being purely test-driven can kind of hold you back a little bit. Um, but it is nice to get to practice that a little bit. I think that is one of the neat parts of exorcism that sets it apart from something like, say, Leet Code, because we do have this structured kind of test file that we do have to work with, right? And this is the same for all the languages that I've looked at. So I've looked at, I think, probably like a dozen different languages on exorcism now. I want to say they have... 50, 60 languages supported, some kind of crazy number like that. Um, I think Julia is the one that I've done the most of, but I'm not 100% sure. I think C++ might be tied because C++ is my other main language. Um, but modulo the test framework, basically all of these exorcism exercises have a, same, a similar general structure uh, even across languages, right? We have this test file or you know, test, test um, suite if it's multiple files, and we just work with that. And the nice thing about this, right, is that all I really need to do, if I start my Julia prompt, my Julia REPL, to get this going is just to include this run tests file. And already we can see we get an exception, right, where the test didn't fail, but it threw an exception, which is, you know, basically a different kind of failure. And what did it say? Well, it said that it's tried to call this point, this function saddle points, and it was not defined. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing we'd want to do is define this function. Okay, and so just for um, anyone uh, watching right now, uh, I will keep an eye on the chat. I might not get to questions in real time, uh, but I will try and answer them periodically. Um, usually, we get uh, a couple stream to stream, so please feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Um, but like I said, I might not get to them right away, but I will try and answer them. You know, every 10, 15 minutes or so. So the first thing that I'll do here is just define this function called saddle points. And to fit with what exorcism's already set up, right, I'll just spell it like this. And, you know, in our test code here, so I will split and then run tests. In our test code here, here, we're using this matrix that they've called M. Uh, of course, I don't need to use the same letter for my function argument, but I'm just going to go ahead because I'm thinking matrix. Right? And one thing to mention here is that I do not need to do something like this to get this to work. Right? Nor is this even something you should do until you have a uh, good idea of whether or not it's necessary. And so what I'm referring to here is Julia is a compiled language. It's a just-in-time compiled language, but I find that it's much better and easier to work with Julia if you think about it as a compiled language that can fall back on dynamism as opposed to a dynamic language that is compiled. <laughs> right? So what you can do in Julia, and what you know, if you look at the assembly code that gets generated and things like that, right? we can reason with these types. We're strongly typed. Um, and we can specify the types of variables and arguments with this syntax that's similar to what Fortran uses, right? This colon colon syntax. And so this isn't strictly wrong, right? What this would do is this would define right now a, a no-op function called saddle points that would only operate on a matrix. So if we were working in a language like C or C++, you know, we'd have to do this. But in Julia, we don't. The only reason I might want to do something like that is if I wanted to have multiple what Julia refers to as methods for this saddle points function, right? So if I wanted to say have a different version of this function that operated on a matrix of floats versus a matrix of integers, 
I might do it like this because when the, uh, Julia's compiler sees a matrix of floats, right, it'll dispatch to this function. When it sees a matrix of ints, it'll dispatch to this function. And being just in time compiled, what really is going to happen here is that uh, as soon as we call this function for the first time with a particular argument of a particular type, Julia will just in time compile a version, a method for that function corresponding to that type. So what you might notice when you start working with Julia is that the first time you run a function tends to be a little bit slower than the others, and that's because the compilation is happening there. But after that, it's you know, much faster, lightning fast, because we have that compilation that we could fall back on. And that happens every time it sees a, a variable of a different type. So if all we do is pass in matrix float 64, right, all we'd ever call is this method, all we ever would get compiled is this method. If we pass in a matrix int the first time, it would, we'd have to pay for the compilation, and then after that, we'd have that compiled function. But since I really only want to have one method, right, I'm not really going to operate any differently on this function if it's floats or ints or whatever, right? That's something that would definitely be a, a secondary concern. And actually, here, let me just shrink this side panel a little bit. Um, that would definitely be a secondary concern. So I'm just going to leave it like this. And this is a good approach, right? Basically writing Julia kind of like Python until you have a reason not to. So... Now that we've gotten a little bit of preamble out of the way, let's take a look at the readme here. So we want to detect saddle points in a matrix. What does that mean? Well, for the purposes of this exercise, a saddle point is greater than or equal to every element in its row and less than or equal to every element in its column. And this is just chosen because, like, like it says at the bottom here, Right? There may be other definitions. A lot of times they tend to be ambiguous or kind of incompatible with each other. So exorcism has chosen this definition for ambiguity purposes, right? to make sure that we're unambiguously specifying what a saddle point means. Now, if you've studied um, multivariable calculus and that kind of thing, you might have a notion of a saddle point that's pretty similar to this. Uh, so this could be useful for, say, if we were looking at uh, a minimum, minimizing or maximizing a multivariate function, we could say, you know, write code to detect saddle points versus maxes and mins. That might be very important. So, right, let's a couple things that we can mention here, right? Your code should be able to provide the possibly empty list of all saddle points, right? So we should make sure to be able to uh, exit sensibly if we haven't found any saddle points, right? That doesn't throw an error or anything like that. That just returns an empty collection. Uh, there's no restriction on the matrix being square, right? And if we think about this definition that they've given, um, might, while it might be easier to implement a version of this, depending on how we approached it for a square matrix, there's really, there's really nothing stopping us, right, for a non-square matrix. And since we have no reason to restrict this to being square, we're going to go ahead and do that. Okay, so I think that's enough introduction. Let's start taking a look at how we might do this. So I've got this matrix M. Right? And the first thing I might want to do here is think about, OK, well, I do want to you know, loop through the rows and columns of M. Right? So I might do something like this, you know, N rows, N calls is equal to size of M. And then I might do something like this, right, where I would loop through And I'm just going to write some placeholder code in here, right? M, I, comma, J, end, end. And then we'll talk for a second. Right? So right, this is how a for loop looks in Julia. It is very similar to how, what, uh, how for loops are written in MATLAB, except for this in here. We can write something like this, right? basically matching the MATLAB syntax. It is recommended not to do that, um, just because the in function, the in operator, is you know an actual first class operator in Julia. Um, this is a little bit more general code that might, you know, be flexible to different kinds of collections and things like that. So what do we want to do here, right? And, of course, this is a totally naive approach that I'm going to do first, right? If you're watching this and thinking already that there might be improvements that I could make to even what I've written so far, let's hold on to that for a second, okay? So I'm going to take this value. And what do I want to do as far as... 
um, my decision, right? So it needs to be greater than or equal to every element in its row and less than or equal to every element in its column. Okay. So what that means, basically, is that the this value has to be the maximum in its row, or sorry, the minimum in its row, right? That's why I'm kind of trying to try to piece right? If it's greater than or equal to every element in its row, right? That means that um, we're thinking about this as the maximum, right? And if it's less than or equal to every element in its column, right? We're thinking about this as the minimum, okay? So how do we do that, right? We do like um, call min, right? Call minimum would be the minimum of m uh, we're in the jth column, right? Because j is our column index here. We've got row max is equal to maximum m i colon. So this is also very, very similar to MATLAB syntax, except for, you know, the square brackets. Um, it means exactly the same thing. So this is a little bit closer to NumPy syntax, which is also very close to MATLAB syntax. So this is done on purpose, right? Julia, a lot of Julia's syntax, especially stuff related to linear algebra, is designed to be similar to NumPy and MATLAB and other existing languages, um, mostly just because there's a reason why those, those, uh, those notations, those syntaxes are popular, um, and it makes it easier to, to switch over. So this is good, right? So what should we do here, right? If Right? We're going to have an if statement. And, well, okay. What do we want to do? If my value is equal to my column minimum and equal to my row minimum, then I'm going to want to do something there, right? Okay, and what am I going to want to do here? Well, there's one piece, one ingredient missing so far. And that is that I haven't actually put any points together, right? I haven't said, okay, well, points equals... In Python, I might write something like this, or even in MATLAB, right? And this would be totally fine. In Julia, this is not such a great idea, right? Because when I write something like this, as it's written right here, this is an array, a vector right now, of type any. And what that means is that Julia will allow any type to go into this vector. So this is a lot like a Python list. And in Python, that's not such a big deal, right? Because we have to pay for that interpreter costs anyways in Python, which is one of the reasons why it's important to vectorize code in Python. Whereas in Julia, if I were to have, say, you know, x be a vector of floats, Julia can uh, generate optimized code that operates on this vector inline because it knows ahead of time that these are all floats. Unlike in Python where every element of the list it have to check what's the type here, what do I do, what instructions do I generate. Julia does not have to do that, right? And those of you who are familiar with MATLAB, Python, et cetera, I might have already done a bit of cringing here at the fact that I'm writing loops. This is fine in Julia. In fact, this is more, most often the fastest way to operate on an array in Julia any kind of vectorization or anything like that that the compiler can do is accommodated for by this, right? Even if I write things in terms of, you know, broadcasting and dot, dot multiply and all that stuff, right? If I look at, go, at the assembly code that gets generated, it'll be the same as if I wrote this. Same thing as if I used maps and other kinds of functional constructs. So that's something that takes a little bit of getting used to in Julia if you're coming from other languages and that loops are not something to be avoided in Julia. Loops are the thing, the place to start in Julia, and you should only move on to fancy vectorization and that kind of stuff if you really have a really good reason to. I myself, I don't think I've ever really made use of explicit vectorization. There's a function, there's packages and stuff to do that kind of stuff. It's really not a concern most of the time. So what I'm going to do here is think about what kind of type would I like from this function, right? And for that, if I look at my test file, well. Okay, what kind of object is this, right, if I didn't know what this was, right? This is a vector, square brackets, but I've got this, you know, 2 comma 1 in regular parentheses. And these are not the same object in Julia, right? There are some languages where you can use brackets or parentheses or whatever, and it doesn't matter. That is not the case of Julia, 
All right, so if I take this variable, I'll just call it v, and what does this call it? It says this is a vector, right? And in my curly braces are the type of the elements of this vector, if it's all the same. And these are tuples, right? So Julia, like some languages, including Python, right, has a separate type for lists or vectors versus tuples. So this is a tuple of two integers. So tuples in Julia work a lot like tuples in C++, right? Where there's type parameters corresponding to each, um, each member in this tuple. One thing that is interesting here, though, like if I take this variable, this value, and put it into a variable, and then I try to, say, modify the first entry, I get a problem. And that's because tuples in Julia are immutable. If you want to change their value, you have to make a new tuple. Vectors, on the other hand, right, I have this vector v. If I wanted to set the first element, or there's only one right now, equal to, say, you know, 3, 2, that's totally fine. So vectors are mutable. Oops. Vectors are mutable, but tuples are not. Something to get used to. And in Julia, a lot of times, we want, we want our types, our custom types especially, we want variables and things to be immutable. Julia does have a pretty strong functional component that isn't necessary, but often helps with performance, with uh, reasoning about the code, and that kind of thing. Okay, so what I'll do here is, um, of course, I blew away my input, right? But if I take this and say, okay, well, this is the type I want. I want points to be a vector of tuples. And not just a vector of tuples, of, in, of uh, two tuples, right? where each member of the tuple is an integer. And actually, you know, the compiler, or sorry, the REPL here is showing me int 64. To be careful, I could just write this as int. Because on a 64-bit machine, int just means it's 64. One thing to definitely watch out for that used to throw me all the time when I started learning Julia is this is not the same as an integer. Right, because an integer, oops, an integer is an abstract type that cannot be instantiated directly. If I were to make this a vector, if I change this code here and write this as vector integer integer, now I'm effectively have the same problem as before, where Julia can't reason about what specific types of integer these are going to be. So what it will do is it will reason about and generate code to operate on this vector as a vector of pointers because it has to decide at runtime what type that's going to be. Whereas if I write this as int comma int, it will know, you know forever and always that this will be a vector of tuples of integers and can write gen uh, generate optimized code that can operate on those integers on this vector in line without having to resort to pointers and that kind of thing. And if you look at your assembly code, you can use something like code native you look at to look at the assembly code that gets generated by an expression you can tell this difference and maybe we'll get to that but um, that's a little bit too far in the weeds for now i think okay and one thing that we can also do here is make use of this uh alias called n tuple or right, this is a compact way of representing tuples that have all the same types for their entries right so i could call this an n tuple of two comma int Right. And, you know, this is one syntax that you can use that I tend to prefer. This is a little bit more modern, in my opinion. Um, you can also use a syntax that's kind of like C, kind of like this. All right. This is these are these two lines that I've just written here are exactly equivalent. These are both instantiating empty vectors where the elements of the vector are these two tuples of integers. But like I said, I tend to like this a little bit more um, just because, like I said, I work in C++ a lot. This is a little bit closer to how you would do this in C++. Um, and that's like a little bit more comfortable for me. And so what we'll do right, is whenever this if statement gets triggered, right, whenever my value is both the minimum in its column and, oops, sorry, the maximum in its row, then I will go ahead and push this value into my vector of points. Oops. And in Julia, right, 
We always return the last line if there's anything in the last line. If not, then it returns nothing, literally nothing. Right? There's a special type called nothing, kind of like none. Uh, but I prefer to write the return statement explicitly always, and this is good style, even if it's returning nothing. Right? And sometimes I'll even return nothing. <laughs> okay, and so let's see. Okay, so what's the problem here? Cannot convert an object of type int64 to an object of type tuple int64. And if I look at my code here, well, I have a slight problem in that I've, I'm pushing in points, right? A value of type, you know, whatever type this matrix has. Okay, that's not great because that is not what this vector is meant to hold, right? So not only can the compiler know ahead of time what type is meant to go in this vector, it will enforce that. It won't let me put a value in this vector that isn't of the correct type, whereas Python will just be like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> if you give it a type hint of what the array should be and you put something else in, your linter might warn you, some other package might warn you, but the Python language itself will be fine with that. Because basically the equivalence here is that um, in Python, all lists are this, you know, any. And we want to avoid that kind of thing in Julia. And so the easiest thing to do here is to say, okay, well, what I actually want to push in is the position of this point and not the actual value. Because we don't care about the value, we care about where it is, at least as far as this exercise is concerned. And that passes. And so what I'll do is go ahead and enable this second test. Okay, so it looks like here, right, we've got, um, you know, this empty matrix and we're having some problems, right, because we're trying to loop over this matrix or something like that, right, we'll diagnose that in a second. Before I get there, I'd like to stop and take a look at this code and make some comments about ways we could improve this both for performance and just to kind of make use of some of the niceties of Julia. So there are two things, or more than two things, but a couple things I like to address first, right? First, notice that I'm looping over rows first and then columns. And in languages like C and C++ and that kind of thing, where we have, or Python, right, where we have row major matrices, arrays, this is the way to do it. But Julia has column major arrays. And what does that mean? That means that we loop through, you know, in memory, we loop through the first column, then the second column, then the third column. So what this is going to be doing here is this is going to be jumping around in my memory, right? Because I'm going to be going from the first row to the second row to the third row to the fourth row and looping through those. And I mean, for an example like this, it's not going to make that much of a difference, but this is a bad habit to get into. So the first thing I'll do right away is swap these out. And then I'll actually address this. So this is how we do this in MATLAB. And this is fine in Julia, right? But especially now that Julia is starting to support, you know, we have this one based indexing by default, but there are packages, uh, very popular packages that incorporate other kinds of indexing, right? Uh, offset arrays is the one that comes to mind where we can basically have whatever indexing scheme we want. Um, so it's often helpful to write code that doesn't necessarily loop through these directly, right? And also that makes it a little bit clearer what we're trying to do here. So what I can do to simplify this a little bit is to write this like this. For j in axes m comma 2, for i in axes m comma 1. And what will this do, right? This expression here, will return a generator, what's called a generator in Julia, for all of the indices corresponding to the second dimension. Same thing with axes m comma 1. And that will be the case regardless of how these are actually indexed. And also notice that before I had to do this separately, right? I had to have the, you know, num points, call, I had to do the size and do all that stuff. Here I just do it automatically. And actually, I can even condense this a little bit. Julia has this nice uh, 
somewhat condensed syntax for nested loops, right? Where I can just um, put this comma in between here. Oops. I forgot you don't need the second four. <laughs> okay. And the nice thing is, look, this has fixed that second test that was broken before. Because Julia knows, hey, for an empty array, both of these are empty collections. So it generates no values for either of these. Both of these loops never actually get hit, and we just return this empty vector of points that we had at the start. So we're getting there, right? Um, what else might we do here? Well, there's one thing that the performance heads out there might have noticed, right? I'm computing the maximum and minimum of all these rows and columns at every position in this array. Whereas, you know, I really only need to do this, you know, one, one time for each row and one time for each column, right? So just for, say, this matrix right here, 9 by 9, I'm going to be computing the row max and the column min nine times each, whereas I really only need to do them three times each, right? Because it's three by three. So how can I do that? Well, there are a couple of ways. So what I will do is I will now do this in a separate loop here, or a separate construct. And I will say, OK, well, how about, let's think about my columns first. And I'm just going to put this, um, put these as you know commented lines for a second just so I can still refer to them. And I'm going to say, OK, well, my column mins, right, because I'm going to collect them all together, I'm going to make use of the maximum function, or the minimum function, of course. right? And there's a couple of different ways I could write this. Uh, and I'll kind of demonstrate each one. The one that I tend to like is using map. So Julia has this map function that is you know, the traditional map from functional programming, uh, very similar to transform in C++. And this will apply some function to a given collection. All right, I can even look at the, that up in my REPL here, my Julia prompt. So one thing to notice right, that I haven't mentioned yet is that within the Julia prompt, if you type the question mark, you get this help menu. And then if I type something in here, it will give me the help for it. Right, so if I scroll up, right, this map operates on a collection, transforms collection C by applying F to each element, right? Exactly what we would expect from a function called map. <laughs> okay, so what is my F going to be here? This is going to be a minimum. And how could I write this? Well, I could write this something like this, right? M... We're looking at columns. And actually, I might might as well use J's here, just to be careful, right? Because I'm using I for column, J for row, or sorry, J for column, I for row. And even I've just screwed myself up here, so I might as well stay consistent. I'll go ahead and close this for now. Um, and this is just a totally fine way to do this, right? So this is what's called a comprehension. Right? We use the same name in Julia that we use in Python. It's not necessarily a list comprehension because it doesn't necessarily have to be a list. And in fact, the way that I've written it here, this will not generate an array. This will generate a generator, which is basically Julia's lazy version of an array. It'll only generate the elements that it's actually asked for, and it'll only generate them one at a time. Saves memory. Right? Um, if I actually wanted to put this into an array, I'd just add the array. But there's actually something even cleaner here, right? Because at least me, I'm like, hey, you know, I got this axes m comma 2 here and here, right? This is redundant. Because there's a way that I can simplify this. And, you know, since Julia is a language that's focused on scientific computing, which tends to involve quite a lot of linear algebra, there are a lot of convenience functions. And I'll use the one here called each call. And what this does, if I look at my help screen, is this returns right an object i don't really care about a column slices object whatever that means right it's a vector of columns of the matrix or vector a and it returns the actual slices into this array okay. and so what you might notice here is that if i go ahead and do row maxes is equal to map maximum each row m 
And then what will I do here? Well, I could write it like this, call min's i, right? Row maxes i, and so I'm sorry, I already screwed up my indexing here, right? This should be a j. Okay, right, but then if, you th if we think about this, right, do I really need to actually index into this each time? Um, you know, maybe not, but in this case, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and leave this. Or actually, you know what I could do is, even though this syntax is a little bit cleaner or a little bit more compact, uh, it does kind of make it hard to do stuff, you know, for each loop in the J, right, for each loop in the I. And what I'm meaning here is that I could say, you know, call min is equal to call min's J, row min is equal to row min's I. And the reason why this is nice is because not only am I only computing the, the column min and the row max one time for each row and column, I'm only retrieving them one time. And oftentimes the Julia compiler is smart enough to kind of know that, you know, I, even if I wrote it the other way, uh, it's smart enough to kind of know how to deal with that. But it's simple enough to, to take care of it myself. And of course, I've gone ahead and done this um, min max switch again. Okay, and so far so good, right? Let's see what we got. Okay, so what kind of problems are we running into? Reducing an over an empty collection is not allowed, right? Okay, so you know my performance concern here has made it a little bit harder to actually do this, but it's not that bad, right? And what I can do here is think, okay, well, let's actually check and see if this array is empty. And if it is, we'll just go ahead and return that empty vector of points. We won't even do anything else, right? Because I'm not going to waste the time to go ahead and try even tr try and do all this operation. Excuse me. And of course, they're not going to work, right? But say they did, right? It wouldn't, it's not even good to try and do this if I can you know, exit early, if I can rule out that I need to do the rest of this operation. And that helps, right? That gives us, actually widen this out a little bit, um, that passes those first two tests. And let's see how good we're doing here. So let's enable these one at a time. Okay, so far so good, right? I'm identifying multiple saddle points in a row, multiple saddle points in a column. Um, I think we're actually pretty much good here. I'm going to go ahead and get a little bit overconfident and just enable all of them. Look at that. So strictly speaking, I've now completed this exercise, right? If I were to go ahead and do um, exorcism submit, and my point, my file is called saddlepoints.jl, if I went ahead and submitted this, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I've submitted the solution, and I can go ahead and oops, <laughs> I can go ahead and check, you know, whether or not it actually passed on their end. Right? They have basically, you know, CI and CD set up to 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 test these and see if they actually work. And if all the tests pass, you pass the exercise. But you what you might notice is that you can have multiple iterations, and that you know you can keep submitting the same exercise with different changes. Right? You can submit your code to be mentored. Right? I t I like to do a lot of mentoring on Exorcism. It's one of my favorite parts of the site. Um, and that, right? And even just in terms of this code, before we move on, let's take a look and think about, you know, are there alternatives we could use here? Well, there are a couple. And, you know, I like I said, you know, using these loops is, you know, usually the first thing to try if you're trying out code in Julia if you're trying to do something involving a matrix. But as I mentioned a little bit, and as we've started to see here, Julia does have some pretty powerful functional programming capabilities. It's, it's not quite a pure, you know, it's not a purely functional language by any stretch of the word, but you can get pretty close and write some pretty, pretty nice functional code in Julia. So let's see about how we might do that. And as far as the first parts here, there really isn't anything I can, re I can do with this, um, at least not right now. But what I might do here is think about this function in Julia called filter, which is, again, 
should you know a pretty a pretty common concept in the functional language. It'll just operate on an array and it'll return only the elements of that array that satisfy some kind of um, nice or some kind of not nice property, some kind of property that I provide, right? If a function that I provide returns true. So how would I do this though, right? Because I don't want to really operate on M directly. I want to operate on the indices of M. And the nice thing about that is that there's actually a notion of this in Julia. It's called Cartesian indices. And if I, you know, look at this right here, this basically gives me all of the indices in an array and, and you know, returns them in a, in a way that uh, I can operate on programmatically. And it respects the dimensionality of the array, right? So if I have this matrix M, right, which I'll just call, I'll make a 10 by 10 matrix of random numbers, because it doesn't matter, and I do Cartesian indices of M, I get the Cartesian indices of a 10 by 10 array. And you might notice here it hasn't printed very much, right? Because this is another lazy object, right? This will only generate the indices that I ask for and only generate them one at a time. Okay, so if I think about this, so what I'll do here is I will leave this here, but I will start to think about how I'm going to do this. So I'm going to want to um, take a filter, and I'll put comma M for now, because I don't really know what's going to go in this first part yet. Okay. Actually, it should be comma Cartesian indices of M. And actually, this is a good opportunity and you know, pretty much required to uh, demonstrate a pretty cool feature of Julia that is definitely weird to read at first if you're not used to this syntax. But um, I think it's quite nice. And that is this do block. And what this is doing is this do i is saying, OK, well, we're going to put a lambda function or a temporary function, an unnamed function in this first slot, right, in this, you know, if I, again, pull up the, the syntax for filter, right, the first, the first thing that goes into filter is this f function. So what Julia is going to let us do is specify what this function should be within this block. Anything that I put in this block corresponds to this function. So I probably want to do basically the same thing that I've done here, right, call min, row max, um, I want to get my value. I will have to tweak this a little bit, but I'll just leave them here for now. Right. And since this is a filter, this function should return a Boolean. Right? It should return the condition that I want, which is the, this if statement. So what I'll go ahead and do is this. And actually, right, that's pretty close. <laughs> The only thing I need to do is consider the fact that I'm taking these Cartesian indices, right, and what I'm mapping over, right, is each element of this, you know, array of indices. So this i here is a two-dimensional index, right? It'll have two values, row and column. So all I'll have to do is i bracket 2, i bracket 1, and then for m, I just put i. I want the first element of this index, the last element of this index, and then just the index for M. And as far as this goes, we're just about there, right? This is actually what I want to return. right? Because what it's asking us for is the position that these... Um, saddle points are at. So let's see what happens. OK, so what kind of problem do I get? Um, oh, OK, I've got this stuff with Cartesian indices. Right? It's got, or I'm returning the actual Cartesian indices when what it wants is tuples. But the nice part about that is um, if I take a Cartesian index, so I'll just kind of demonstrate this right here. So say my index is 1, 2, 
right? Just to demonstrate, right, we can do i of 1, i of 2, and then I can do tuple of i to get a tuple. So how do I figure out how to do that here? Well, I take this array that I've gotten from my filter, and I map over it. I just do map tuple over this whole array. And of course, you know, what I've written there will probably be okay, but I'll write it in this slightly slightly less uh, confusing way. And if I wanted to, right, I could write this like this, you know, where I could put another do block in here. And But, of course, this is a function that already exists, so I don't really need to do that because right? I can just pass this function tuple in there, the constructor for a tuple. So how are we looking? And so all our tests pass, which is neat. Okay. And so one thing you might say is, you know, this is kind of uh, broken that tiny optimization I did of, you know, only retrieving the minimum and maximum one time for each row and column, right? I'm still computing them one time, but now I'm retrieving them nine times. Um, but that's not such a big deal. Julia's compiler is pretty smart about that kind of stuff, and we'll probably do some kind of optimization here. Okay. So with that, I'll move on to another exercise. And let me see, let me take a quick scan through. Oh, yeah, okay, here, I'll do the this one. Another one that I've done, you know, maybe like a year ago now, but um, will be cool to try out. So I'll try out this example called uh, Robot Simulator. And with the time I've got, I'm not sure that I'll get through the whole thing, but we'll get through a good chunk of it, I think. All right, so I've got this Robot Simulator exercise. Looking at my window, I should probably make this even a little bit bigger. It looks like I actually do have this here from when I did it last time, so I'll just go ahead and blast that out. Okay. Again, open up my directory, do the same kind of thing. Or I have my Julia REPL over here. And of course, since my, my type is so big, it's kind of screwing up the stuff here. And your own window, you probably not see it this way, but that's okay. And so I think there'll probably be some stuff. Yeah, I'll go ahead and delete all this. Start from scratch. So what do we want to do here? We want to write a robot simulator. So the robots have three possible movements. They can turn right, they can turn left, and they can advance. Right, we're on this infinite grid, so we don't have to worry about bumping into walls or anything like that. Um, and so what we do is we start out on some position facing some particular direction, and we're thinking about the cardinal directions, north, south, east, south, or west, um, increasing to the north and east, so pretty much exactly what you would want, right, with your right-handed coordinate system. And then we pass some instructions. And we want to be able to pass instructions as a string like this, where this says, you know, we go right, and then we advance, and then we advance, and then we go left, and then we advance, and of course, this is a, a, a simplified example, but if you've ever dealt with, you know, relatively simple hardware, um, you know, breakout boards and stuff like that, and uh, especially stuff related to imaging, right? This is some, a, a syntax, these kind of string commands being sent over like a serial connection or something like that. It's actually not all that different from how you might actually implement this. Okay. So this is the basic idea. And again, what we'll do is we'll look at the test first. And I will start with just the first one. Okay, so the first one is just a constructor, right? testing out the robot's constructor and making sure that it assigns things correctly. Okay, so I will keep this open for up here, but I'll go ahead and open my file and just see what happens. Okay, so what have we got? Robot not defined. Okay, same problem we had last time, except for a type. So I'll write struct robot. What does that get me? North not defined, right? So it doesn't know what... It's okay with the robot now, but it doesn't know what this north is. And looking at this constructor here, I can already kind of tell what they're going to want me to do as far as how this is set up. 
And this is, you know, as far as test-driven development goes, is the way we might approach this. We might kind of already know what we want the interface to look like. We just haven't decided on the implementation yet. So I want my first entry, sorry, my first field to be a position, which is called pause. And I want the second one to be my direction. Or actually, no, they call it a heading. Don't do it like that. Why not? It can be a little bit verbose here. That's fine. And I'm going to go ahead and leave these like this for now. Um, when you define structures in Julia, you should always put something here for the type of these, right? Structures are different from functions in that if we specify the types in the structure carefully, we then don't have to specify them as carefully in the function as long as we have everything else set up. So my position, right? Well, it looks like they're going to want position equals point, right? So they want to have this point that has two elements, right? So what we'll do is we actually need two types here. So I'll have a second structure called point, and I'll just say x and y. And here I kind of already have a good idea how I want this to look, right? I want this x and y to be the same type. That'll be my type parameter for my point class or point type. And then what I'll do is go ahead and say, well, I don't strictly need to do this, but I do know that these should be numbers, so I'll go ahead and put that restriction in here. And then since the position has a type parameter, right, position t, I'll go ahead and include that as a parameter in the robot. And this is important, right? If I were just to write it like this, then I'd run into the same problem as my array of any, right, in that Julia at runtime will not know what type this is under the hood. So it'll have to generate indirect code, right? It'll have to generate code in terms of pointers and dynamic casts and that kind of stuff. Whereas if I include this type parameter here, very much like a C++ template, whatever this type of position is, right? It'll fill in that type name in ter uh, where T is, and the robot will be parameterized by that. And of course, since the point is enforcing that t should be a number, I don't really need to put this here, but I'm going to go ahead and put that this should be a number. Now, I could do it like this, where I just have a regular point, you know, one single point structure where they're all integers or whatever. But there's really no reason to do that, <laughs> right? It's easy enough to make this nice and general. It doesn't cost us anything. It doesn't really even complicate the code that much. So I might as well. I think in this example they use only integers, but that's not such a big deal. And as far as the heading, well, I'm going to have to make a type for heading as well, right? But one thing to notice is that we're referring to this capital north. Someone's in a hurry out there, I guess. Uh, referring to this capital north, right? So this is a pretty common way to write, you know, a, a constant value. And if I want to have constants that are named, and then I might want to do some kind of simple numerical operations on, or think about the order of these constants, right? If I'm thinking about, we're already talking about rotating this robot, right? Turning left and right. So I probably will want to have some notion of, you know, north, what comes after north, what's before north, right? So in many other languages, well, the first thing that might come to mind here, at least for me, is an enum, an enumeration. And Julie actually does have a notion of enum. Basically works the same as it would in any other language. And the easiest way to build an enum is to use this enum macro. And so what I'll do here is say at enum heading begin end, right? So I put the in the block here I put the different values. So I'll do north and then if I'm already thinking about the ordering, right? Well, you know, I could go either way. Uh, I'm gonna go I guess clockwise, right, and say north, east, south, and west. Could also do anti-clockwise, that's fine. Just have to pick one. And since I've gone ahead and redefined some stuff, right, I'm gonna have to just restart my Julia REPL. This only happens when we redefine global constants and things like like types. Uh, the REPL, you know, can only really store one version of that type at a time in order to get um, you know, sensible performance and that kind of stuff. So we do have to, to go ahead and restart when we do stuff like that. There are ways around that, but I'm not going to deal with that right now. 
and of course, right, position not defined. Um, so, oh, I call that position instead of point. Sorry. Okay. Well, and I already kind of want to know, right? This is a pretty common idiom in Julia too, where we have these, you know, where uh, in an object-oriented like language might be called a getter function. Because in Julia, right, we don't have classes, right? This is a this is a, a, t a type. It holds data, but it doesn't hold functions. And not only that, uh, most of the time, we want to think about these these fields. We call them in Julia. We might call them members in another language. We want to think about these as being private. For very simple classes that are or to keep calling them classes, sorry. For very simple types that are just data, uh, this is such a big deal, right? But especially for something like this, where we're kind of encapsulating an uh, idea, right, an abstraction into this object, um, we don't want to necessarily have other um, other code be reaching into this object and changing things, right? Now there isn't a way to do like in C plus plus, right? I could just put private here and then I'd be done. You can't do that in Julia, but at least I can kind of get a chunk of the way there, especially with you know my documentation and stuff might refer to these. And so what I'll do is I'll write position for a robot is equal to um, r dot position heading for a robot is equal to r dot heading. And right here I've used this nice uh, one-liner syntax that Julia has where I can define a function that's just a single line, right? I could also write this as, you know, function position and then, you know, return the position. And depending on how long the single line is, a lot of times that's better, but um, I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. And so what have we got? Okay, what kind of error do we have here? Uh, no method match matching robot, tuple, and 64 heading. Well, what's the problem? I'm storing this as a point, right? And I want the position function to return a point. But this constructor, if I look carefully here, is passing in a tuple. That's fine. I'll just make a constructor. It says, okay, well. And it should be, um, sorry, <laughs> point, pause, heading. So now you might wonder what this dot syntax is about. Um, this is basically saying, okay, well, whatever position is, you notice I haven't specified the type of position here. Whatever position is, as long as I can unroll it, you know, we call this splatting in Julia. <laughs> it's kind of a weird name, but it's the name that the manual uses. I'm splatting this out into all of its elements, right? So if, you know, pause has two elements, which it should, if it's a two tuple, then this would be the same as if I did something like this, x comma y is equal to pause, and then put x comma y here. These, in fact, are exactly the same thing. But I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. And you might say, hey, you know, you specified types for these two, but not this one. What's that about? And that's because basically I want this to work for anything that I can do this splatting operation on that works for a point. Right? That has two elements and then a point could be constructed from at least, you know, what I've called a point here. And, you know, the natural concern there is that, you know, because I haven't specified this type, I'm going to generate unoptimized code. Right? I'm going to have to do a lot of dynamic inferencing and that kind of stuff. That's not the case. We'll get a different method for this function from the compiler for every different type that we pass in for a position, right? So we could pass in a, a vector, we could pass in a tuple. Um, that's pretty much all that I can think of that would be appropriate, right? Um, the one thing that this won't, right, and what I'll go ahead and do is put in heading here, which I don't really strictly need to do, but I do know that this heading really has to be the one thing, right? Um, what I always get for free is a constructor that will take, you know, the position as a point and then the heading as a heading, 
right? It'll effectively always give me, you know, the, the simplest constructor where I just pass in the fields in order. And then if that doesn't make sense, right, if the compiler can't figure out a way to reconcile that definition with what I've passed it, it will fall back on the, mo the next most specific thing, which in this case would be this kind of omnibus method. Okay, so that's cool. Um, let's see what we've got. That passes our first test. Right? Because what this is doing is saying, well, this tuple, this can be splatted. <laughs> Right? It can be splatted to the correct number of things, so we're good. If I were to change this to a vector instead, and then run my tests, no difference. We'll call a different function, but the, you know, under the hood, no difference in terms of you know, my tests passing. So let's move on to the second test. Mutating functions should return robot. Okay, so this is actually pretty common in Julia. Two things. Firstly, if you have a function that mutates its argument, right, that you know uh, operates on its argument in place, then we usually put this exclamation point at the end of the function. And that's just like, hey, watch out. This is going to be changing what we pass in. No, that's fine. A lot of times we like to avoid that kind of stuff, but especially for, say, like linear algebra and things, it could be a good idea to do operations in place so we don't have to do a bunch of reallocating matrices and that kind of thing. Um, for our case, it doesn't really matter that much because this is such a simple structure, but I'll go ahead and take these. I'll just kind of think about it like this, right? So I'll first just kind of comment each out. And say, okay, well, first I want to have this function called um, turn right. And, you know, technically I don't really have to specify that this is a robot. But I really would not like this function to work on anything else. <laughs> Unlike this, where I really don't care what kind of collection this is, as long as it's got two elements. Here, you know, I really don't want this turn right to do something that I'm not intending and work on some kind of other type. I don't think that could happen just based on what we put into it, but let's be careful. And we'll do the same thing with left. Um, and the same thing with advance. And then the same thing with move. And I'll go ahead and put robot robot. And as for this, I'll just call this command. I could do command string. Nah, right? I don't necessarily want it to be a string. I mean, I can't really think of what else you could, I guess, maybe pass. You know, what might also work is if I passed, you know, a vector of characters or something like that. Um, that's not like C where those are totally interchangeable ideas, but you know, a lot of times they work. Uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and leave it like this. And as far as this test goes, right, as, if I'm thinking about test-driven development, I only want to write enough code to get this to work. So what does that mean? I want these all to return their argument. And this is a common pattern in Julia, where if you do have a mutating function, it returns the thing that got mutated. And that even passes our test. Okay, so now we're going to start doing some commands. We want to rotate positive pi over 2. Okay, so we're going to go, you know, north, east, south, west, and back to north. And so I just got lucky and picked the right direction, right? Technically, if we're thinking about trigonometry and stuff, this should really be negative pi over 2 because we're going clockwise, but that's not such a big deal. Okay, so I'm going to even be more careful with this one and just enable one at a time. So far, so good, right? We're just making sure that this works, making sure that we have the right stuff here. Um, and as far as turning, right, that's not going to change our position, but it is going to change our heading from north to east. So 
Well, how could we do this? I go up to my turn right. Break this out a little bit. Okay. Well, let's take our original heading. Right next, I'll be careful here. Heading R. Okay. Well, how do I want to think about this? Well, let's start with one heading being just equal to north. Notice that Julie has done kind of what we would hope here, unless otherwise specified, and started this enum at zero. And if I go ahead and convert this, I'd get zero. So what I'll do is say my original heading, and I will actually go ahead and convert this to an integer. And then what do I want to do? Well, I want to increment to the next one. And I want to be careful, though, <laughs> right? Because right now, I've converted this to an integer, so it will happily go outside the range that this enum is actually defined for, right? My enum is really only defined for 0 to 3, north, east, south, west, right? So what I want to be careful here is um, I want to make sure to take this, you know, modulo. So I'll write original heading equals... Um, original heading plus one mod four. So what this is going to do is divide this number that it gets by four, and then it's going to um, return the remainder. <laughs> and what that do, right, what that will do Right? If you're familiar with modular arithmetic, right, is that'll just basically take any number and map it to either 0, 1, 2, or 3. And for our case, it's kind of like a clock. What we really want to do is say, okay, well, if we go past 3 and hit 4, that's really going all the way around back to 0. And then what I can do is say, you know, r.heading is equal to, um, so actually I'll call this new heading. And then I return my r, right? And what happens when I run my tests? Cannot convert an object of type int64 to an object of type heading. OK, well, that's because I haven't converted this to a heading. Immutable struct of type robot cannot be changed. So this is a little bit about what I was referring to kind of indirectly before. Structures, data types in Julia, are immutable by default. So you can't change the values of their fields. If I want to make it mutable, which I usually shouldn't do, but for this case, what we really specifically want this to do is be mutable, is I just add mutable to the front, right? I call it a mutable structure instead. And of course, since I've changed this type, I'm going to have to go ahead and restart my REPL here. And that passes my test. If I go ahead here and say this, all right, turn has. We'll go ahead and see how good we're doing. We pass all of our tests here, which is cool. Okay, and if I'm thinking about how this is playing out, right, um, I think this is just about as, you know, I guess we could technically um, simplify this a little bit and say, you know, my new heading is going to be this expression here. I'll just make this a little bit more condensed. doesn't really matter. Right? Um, for turning left, it's going to be very similar except, right, I'm going to be subtracting instead of adding, right? I'm going the opposite direction. So let's see how we're doing there. And there it is. I said earlier, the giant type kind of screws with you sometimes because you see so much less than you're typically used to. Make it a little bit bigger just because it is a little small. Let's see how we're doing. So far, so good.
Okay. So now we've got some stuff about changing our, you know, advancing, right? Okay. So let's take these one at a time. Actually, so that means we'll probably have to do this one. Position R equals right, 0, 1. So we're not advancing, right? Our advance is a no-op right now. So what will we want to do? Well, let's think about this. There's a couple ways we could handle this. Um, and one way we could handle this, right, is to think about um, for each heading that we have, right, we're going to be moving in a different direction, of course, and we could think about that as a point. Right, we could add the position that we're at to the, you know, vector that we're moving. And the reason why I think it's nice to think about like that is because each heading will have, you know, a unique vector that it gets mapped to of the four. And so what will we do? Well, we'll say for our point here, if we want to um, construct a point from a heading, uh, well, I mean, we don't necessarily need to do a function here. We could probably also use like a dictionary or something, but I'll go ahead and use a function and say, well, the simplest thing would just be to do this by if statements, right? Because there's only four values anyways. Um, but actually, now that I think about it, that's a pretty good um, case to use a dictionary, right? So I'll call this, you know, point to or heading to point. Equals dict. And the nice thing about Julia Dix is um, just like functions and stuff, I don't necessarily need to specify what types are actually going into this dictionary. Um, and that's really nice, especially if you don't, you know, kind of like auto in C++ if you don't want to be bothered with like sitting down and figuring out what type should actually get returned by this thing. So what I'll do is say, well, my first one will be my first heading goes north. And if I want to move north, right, that's up one. So that would be point zero comma one and this is the syntax we use right this creates a pair north to point and then we'll have um, east is going to be point one comma zero right because like we said north and east are the positive directions uh, south will be point you want to write point capital for some reason zero comma negative one right down one and west is left one, so we'll call this point negative one comma zero. Okay. And the reason why that we'll do that, right, is because if I go down to my advance function, I'll say, you know, r dot position is equal to Well, I'm adding to it, right? Plus equals heading to point of r dot heading. Okay, so objects are not callable. So what have I done here? Um, so let's see. In my advance function, heading to point. Oh, that's because heading is not. I've made this a dictionary, not a function. No method matching doesn't know what I mean when I'm adding together two points. Well, that's easy enough. Add a method for addition. If I add two points together, x and y, what I want to return is x dot x plus y dot x. And actually, so instead of calling this, I'll call this p1 and p2. because I want to use x dot, and it's not strictly wrong. You know, scoping and all that will guarantee that that'll work out okay, but it is kind of hard to read. So I'll say p1 dot y plus p2 dot y, and we're set, right? So this is something that's very common, right? I'm taking this function plus that's defined in base Julia, right? So I have to explicitly qualify it in order to be able to add a new method. 
And so that process that I said before of every time, you know, the compiler sees different types pass into this function, where previously it saw these types, it saw this two point type, right? And it had no idea what to do with it. It's like, I have not seen this before. You haven't given me any information on how to do this. I can't figure out how to do this from like type promotion or anything like that. So what we do is we say, okay, cool. We'll figure, we'll specify the method ourselves. And we can do something like this too, right? Because, I mean, where we have, you know, turn right, we'll almost certainly have turn left. So I'll split this into my run tests. And what have we got here? Okay, so let's see how the rest of this is doing. Okay, and actually, I misspoke before because this is for advancing. So actually, you probably don't need the minus method, but I'll include it just in case. Okay. And so now we'll think about, you know, parsing these instructions. Okay. Moving east and north. And I think this is basically just almost the end of this exercise, right? So actually, we should be able to finish this, I think. We're a little bit. Okay, cool, 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 cool. So as before, we'll go ahead and suppress all but. I accidentally clicked off. Sorry about that. Go ahead and suppress all but the first of these tests, right? Okay. And let's see what we get, right? Of course, this isn't going to work because this function move is currently a no-op. And well, let's think about this, right? Well, and if I take a string, so I'll just take this string that they have, R-A-A-L-A-L. I can loop through this, right, for i in, or I'll call it for a character in string, character. And Julia does make a distinction between strings and characters, right? A string is made of characters. If I take the first element of this string, I get a character. But that's cool because that means that I can do stuff to strings as if they were basically, you know, they're a collection. So what I'll do is say, you know, for each... Um, of something, right? We're going to want to figure out here uh, for each of all the commands that I parse. All right, so I'll go ahead and call this, um, you know, parsed commands, which I'll figure out how to do in a second. For each of these parse commands, right? It so actually doesn't really make any sense. Um, so let's think about this. If I want to take this string and parse it into commands, I, I'm going to write a method to do that that I'll put in here. And again, this doesn't really, I don't really need to specify the type here, um, so I won't. And I'll say, okay, well, um, let me make sure I can do this. Cool. So what I'll do is I'll say, you know, return map of parse command over my all my commands, and actually what I'll do is I'll call this commands, just to be careful. So this is parse commands, right, over all the commands, and I'll do them one at a time as well, right, parse command for a single command. And actually, I'll show off a little bit about how we would do this in terms of, of methods, right, so this will be a method on the string, this will be a method on each individual character. And what do we want this to return? Well, simplest case, right? If this character command is equal to R, we will um, return turn right, the function, right? Functions are first class objects in Julia, so that's fine. Um, if this command is equal to L, we'll return turn left. And if it's equal to um, A will advance. And this is totally fine, right? We can return these functions. And up here, what this will do is it'll apply, right, for each, and I guess I called this commands, um, something like this, for each of these, 
right, we're parsing through these. And so what I'll do in terms of this move, right, is I'll say um, parsed commands is equal to parse command from command. So what this will do is it will see, you know, that this is um, a string. So it will call this method, which then calls the method on each element of the string. And each element of the string is a character. So it'll call this method, and then we're good. And then what we'll want to do for each of the parsed commands, well, what we want to do, we'll want to take that command and apply it to the robot. So this is actually a little bit backwards from how we usually write like a for each or a map, right? Because we'd usually be, you know, f to f of x, where x is the thing that's coming from the collection. But now, right, the input to these functions is all the same. What we're mapping over is the functions themselves. Okay, so if we map over this string, right, that's going to be kind of a pain, right, is what it's saying. So, routine, uh, you know, this is a problem. We could collect it, but what we'll do here is we'll use, we'll take its second suggestion and use a comprehension. Objects of type nothing are not callable. Okay, so... Let's see what have we done here. Parse command C for C and command. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we can do this. Looks like we're not returning anything. Um, so maybe let me just be less crafty here and just use a regular. Yeah, and then we'll do it like this, right? We'll do the smart thing. And if this is an invalid command, we'll throw an error. Okay. Invalid command. So what have we done? We've accidentally... Um, I think maybe I typed something wrong. So we've got R, L, and A. Invalid command. Hmm. Let's take a look here. So here, let's do the, the cheap thing. Just print this. Julia does have debuggers and stuff. I'm not going to go ahead and do that yet. Um, oh, the, re the problem here is that I've made the classic mistake of not remembering that Julia makes a distinction between characters and strings, right? So in Python, if I were to write R with these double quotes, if I were to write R with these single quotes, that's the same thing. But even as my syntax highlighting here is suggesting, in, in Julia, these are not the same. This is the string with, you know, the single character R, which is not the same as the single character R. So I just take these and replace them. I probably should have had some kind of, you know, sanitization on that. Anyways, look, lo and behold, we're looking good. And I bet that will just about do it for us, but let's see. So there's two more tests left. Let's roll the dice here and see how we do. And we're good. So technically, we've now completed this exercise as well. And of course, you know, there could be all kinds of ways I could probably improve this. Um, right? In particular, I've kind of used two different patterns here and that I've stored this conversion in a dictionary when it'd probably be smarter to write, you know, a uh, constructor like I was originally going to do or right because I've done that down here so it's like I should pick one or the other right it'd probably be smarter to have you know commands um, be like a dictionary 
where I'm mapping, you know, R goes to turn right, L goes to turn left, and A goes to advance. And then what I do here for my parse command is actually I could either, you know, eliminate this method entirely, um, or one thing I could do, right, is uh, if has key command, comma, commands. So what this is going to do is it's going to check this dictionary first to see if this command is legit. Um, and what I'll do is I will return... commands cmd and then i really don't even need this if else stuff right this is a nicer way a much cleaner way to write this i like to do this kind of stuff right this guard clause approach where instead of having these you know if statements and my nested returns and all that business right if i hit this first one i'm good if anything else right i throw this bad invalid arguments let's see that's what we're gonna do ASCII character dictionary. I think I might have. Oh, yeah, I just switched them, right? It actually should be if. One way that I found kind of helps with thinking about how a lot of these operations in Julia work is it's kind of like, um, um, what's it called? Polish notation, I think. Um, maybe I'm thinking of the wrong name. Right, basically, like if I wrote like plus one comma two, that's the same as one plus two. Just like, you know, has key commands, comma, command would be the same as is, you know, commands has key command. In a lot of cases, we can even write it that way. Like if I have a vector, you know, I'll just do it like this. X is 1, comma, 2, comma, 3. I could do in 1, comma, X. Or I could do 1 in X. Or I could even do 1 in X like that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's reverse Polish notation. I knew there was. I knew it was something like that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but I think you get. I think you understand what I'm getting at, or maybe that's even the incorrect thing. I'm not sure. But it's basically this idea of, especially when you're writing like parsers and things like that, it's a little bit uh, more rigorous, more um, precise to write your operations in this this kind of you know functional style, uh, which you can then translate back into the more traditional infix style right this prefix versus infix and all that um and this is cool right because what this will do is this will you know say okay well does is this a valid command at all if not then um we throw this argument error and actually what we could do is do something like this right uh you know have a function that's like is valid command for a command and set that equal to this has key And that's basically just for readability's sake. If is valid command, command. And actually, if we're thinking about this guard clause approach, it would probably be smarter to do it like this. Right? If this is not a valid command, then we don't do anything else. <laughs> right? We don't even try. And that's you know more or less equivalent to what I just wrote, but in terms of my control flow in my brain, right? I think that makes a little bit more sense. And of course, you know, some of the, the approach I've taken here is not the only one. Um, you don't have to use an enum here. What you could do, and I won't get into the details here because I've already gone a little bit over time. We could do something like this, where instead of defining this enum, I could have, you know, a single type, an abstract type. That is a heading. Right, so, and then make, you know, uh, struct north. Um, I'm actually not sure if this will work just because of the fact that these tests, you know, have south heading, blah, blah, blah. So these are all types that are subtypes of this type heading, right? If I have a function like f x heading, this will work on any of these subtypes. Right? Um, I'm not sure if this is actually a good way to do this just because if I look at my run tests file, um, yeah, see, right, they have this. So this heading returns a type. Doesn't really make sense to me. This heading heading should be a value, right? It shouldn't just be a type. Because otherwise, 
Um, all right, if I look at my definition of my structure, I am gonna have to have this this parameter in my robot be a heading, you know, like type heading or something like that. And I don't really want to do that, right? That's a pain. So I think this is a case where I really think enum is the way to go. Um, enums are really not that commonly used in Julia for whatever reason. I think just because it's kind of a weird syntax, um, especially consider compared to something like C++, where you seem to see them all the time. I like them. Uh, people I've worked with have kind of <laughs> mentioned that I like them quite a lot. Uh, so maybe that's a little bit of bias. But uh, like I said, I've gone a little bit over time already, although I don't think there's anybody after me, so that's probably fine. Um, this is really fun, so I kind of got a little bit carried away. So thank you all for sticking around. Thanks for another great stream. Um, like I said, this is my third of four live streams that I'll be doing for this analytical April. My next one and final one will be same time next week, Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, so I hope to see you then. And thanks, everyone, for coming out. It's been a great time, and um, I will see you soon. <laughs>